The cure for high prices is high prices, and the cure for low prices is low prices. And that's because higher prices incentivize more production. And more production creates more supply, and more supply creates a glut in the market. And a glut in the market creates lower prices. At least that's how it's supposed to work, but... The energy market, having been an exception for the last decade, has seen an underinvestment where it needs to see more investments for capital expenditure to create more production. In today's episode, we are going to look at the energy crisis and why it's not getting any better anytime soon, but there's a silver lining to this. For us that do the work, for the savvy investors out there that can see through the asymmetry of reality and expectations, we can capitalize on this and actually potentially grow our wealth. Before we get started though, nothing in this video is financial advice. I am not a financial advisor. Do your own due diligence. It's your money, your responsibility. With that said, let's go ahead and dive into our first chart that's looking at the percent of renewable CapEx as a whole for the entire energy space. As you can see here, this dashed red line on the graph tells us the percentage of uh, capital expenditure from the renewables. Um, and it's sitting at about 25% by the end of 2021. Now, these bars right beneath it or juxtaposed right on it, um, in some cases, th these represent the total amount of energy expenditure across the broad energy sector, including nuclear, coal, oil, nat gas, biofuels, you name it. Okay. And the clear trend here since 2014, as we can see here, has been down and not stopping anywhere, you know, anywhere, anytime soon. So despite this increased uh, expenditure on the renewables front, it looks like renewables, which are represented here in light green here in the middle, uh, they've pretty much kept up their, their CapEx expenditures across the years. It's just that everything else, whether it be coal, whether it be oil and gas, whether it be nuclear, has dwindled down over the years. And this is what brings us to the energy crisis of today. There just isn't, there has, there isn't enough molecules, there aren't enough molecules out there because money, capital hasn't been flowing in to these sectors for almost 10 years now. Now, this chart, on the other hand, represents big oil. Big oil across Exxon, Shell, Chevron, Total Energies, and BP. And the common trait here is we've seen a fund, a, a strong and substantial decrease in capital expenditure across the years for all of these big oil companies. Um, we've seen it. We've seen the biggest drop coming from Chevron, Total Energies, and BP. Uh, as you can see here, here in black Exxon, even though, you know, in 2013, which was just about the high here, was we were sitting about $33.7 billion in CapEx on Exxon. Today, we're sitting on about $18.2 billion. So it's about been sliced in half. But it's nowhere near as bad as something like, let's say, Chevron here in blue. Going from $38 billion in 2013 down to a mere $11.8 billion, so a 66% reduction just about. So the common thread here, guys, is that energy just hasn't, there, the money hasn't been flowing into energy to, to incentivize greater production and just lower prices. So we're reaching this crescendo of abundance that we've seen in multiple decades now, um, certainly within the time of my lifespan, you know, I've enjoyed the fruits of all of this abundance, but nonetheless, this is what we're seeing as a result um, of this underinvestment. We, we're seeing prices skyrocket in the case of oil. This is the oil price across its history. Well, across until about 1984. 
And you can see here we hit our peak at about $130. And what I've pretty much done here, guys, is I've included this linear regression best fit line. So this line here in the middle is the best fit line for this graph. So it finds it finds the right slope for this line such that any deviations from this line all equal out to zero. It's it's literally the best, it's literally the trend over the last, what is it, 35, you know, 30, 40 years almost. Okay. And anything above this middle line, all the way up to here, this is within two standard deviations of the norm within the last 40 years. Anything below is within is below two standard deviations. And what do we see? Anytime we cross above this two standard deviation line, we see a massive reversion back to mean. We saw it here in 2008. We vastly outperformed this two standard deviation line and correct it all the way back down be below the mean here, possibly here, probably this is probably the one standard deviation level. And then in 2014, we went back, you know, we crossed, we hit our heads on this two standard deviation line and went all the way back down to test this two standard deviation line below the mean. So this is where we're at today, guys. Um, you know, we're right at just about the average trend. We've reverted back to mean in oil. So, you know, we're in this value, you know, this is undervalued territory almost or just about. We can also say, oh, and one more thing, guys, if if uh, you can see this number here, this number is the R squared value. It says 0 0.71. And what this number means is that 71% of the trend is captured in this line here. And so that means about 29% of this, this data is essentially noise, but a large part of this data is being captured by this trend. This tells us that the regression line is, is adequate, that the regression model that's used to model this line is adequate. And if we run the same regression line here on natural gas, um, we we can see we can see this two standard deviation these, the two standard deviation bands although the R squared here is sitting at 0 0.2 so 20 only 20 percent of the variation um, is captured by this linear regression line this trend only captures 20 percent of the data and that's because as you can see here we see vast movements up and down um, so it makes it really hard to form um, a sol uh, um, a clear cut trend line. Uh, here in terms of natural gas. But nonetheless, as you can see here in natural gas, uh, this is on the monthly level here, guys. Uh, it looks like we're, we're the momentum is slowing down on the downside. And, uh, you know, we've, we're about a little under, probably a little over one standard deviation below the mean here. Again, this is, this is a two standard deviation measure from here down to here. And it looks like we're a little over half that way through. So that means we're one standard deviation below the mean. Um, you know, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not your financial advisor, but um, I'm certainly considering buying uh, on this dip here. And if we look at the weeklies, let's pull that up. Uh, yeah, I mean, the momentum does seem to be slowing down. We had a number of large weekly red candlesticks, but the last few weeks we've been closing the week with some green. So that's a signal here. So that's a signal that the momentum is slowing down and we could be bottoming here. And this brings us to just about the same level that we were in December of 2020. And as you can see here on the weeklies, we're just about touching that two standard deviation line. Now, this is a linear regression line that goes all the way back to August of 2015. So it's not as long term, but as you can see here, the R squared value is sitting at 0 0.54. So a much better R squared value telling us that 54% of the trend is explained by the data.
on the uranium side, and the reason why, so this is uranium, but the reason why I didn't include a linear regression line is just because we, relatively speaking, we don't have as much data on uranium here on TradingView as we do with natural gas and oil. And you, you, you might say, oh, well, we got all the way back to 2008. But in the case of oil, we, you know, we were able to go all the way back 40 years. In the case of nat gas, we were able to go all the way back, what is it, uh, back to the 90s. Again, 40 years, just about 30, 35 years. But in the case of uranium, uh, we've only we're only capturing the data here that goes back to uh, you know the top of the last bull market. We're not capturing the lead up to the bull market. So it, you know the linear regression line will mistakenly measure out uranium as as a secular downtrend commodity over time. So that's why I kind of wanted to avoid adding that line here. Um, but nonetheless, if you can you know if we look at these, let's go on the weekly here. If you look at the weekly, uh, we've been we've been br we've broken out of this um, uh, uh, squeezing pattern. Uh, we've broken out of this resistance line, and we've closed above it for three weeks in a row now. So you know, uranium is still looking good, guys. I mean, look at this, look at this most recent week. I mean, that's a pretty strong uh, candlestick, a green candlestick. So you know, we broke out. We saw a little, a, a bit of a, re, a small red week, but um, we've recovered, and we're sitting about 51.75. So uranium is, you know, there, I know there's there's a lot of impatient people on FinTwit. There's a lot of impatient people everywhere on Reddit, all these other places. But the money is made in waiting, guys. I mean, this is this is not going to be like we saw in summer of 2021, where we just had like. 100% moves within the span of a week or two, okay? Um, and that's not, a, that's not a healthy thing to, to, to want or to go through in, in an asset. Um, you know, that's going to lead to massive volatility. Um, bull markets uh, crawl a wall of worry. Um, the mob psych mob psychology psychology just works that way. If you have, a, if you have multiple 100% moves within the span of weeks, then you're going to you're going to elicit more selling. People are going to take more profits, going to shake more people out. It's going to create euphoria and fear within the asset. So it's not a healthy thing that we want for uranium. Uh, we want uranium to continue climbing this support line. You know, this has been climbing this support line steadily and reliably um, for the last what is it, two years now. So it's been a consistent winner. And then finally, before we close things up here, I wanted to kind of uh, walk you guys through here this this tweet from Ryan Dietrich, CMT on Twitter at Ryan Dietrich, and this ports this pertains to the uh, economy and the uh, recession that everyone's talking about. Um, uh, again, a recession will drive down our commodity prices, like it will drive down everything else, most likely, especially if it's if it comes with a crash in the broader market but these two graphs here tell a different story these are delinquencies that go all the way back to 2003 and this top chart here shows that the top of this of the last big delinquency um you know i don't want to call it a bull market but the last the last big delinquency um you know year which was about 2008, 2009, sitting at about here. Um, this is where we're at today, guys. I mean, we're still, we, there aren't nearly as enough, as many delinquencies as there were back then in 08, 09, which is when we had our big recession. So we've still got a long ways to go. Now, some people might say, if you look at this bottom chart here, this chart breaks down delinquencies oh, you know, with 90 plus day delinquencies uh, by loan type, which includes everything from student loans to credit cards, uh, what is this, mortgage, auto loan, et cetera. And a lot of people, you know, some people might point to the fact that, okay, well, student loans dropped you know, off a of mountain basically. And that's because of the forbearance program and all the stuff that comes with it. You know, maybe this is driving this this move down in delinquencies. Well, you know, be that as it may, uh, 90 plus day delinquencies, which are shaded here in yellow. I mean, that only makes up a small sliver. Okay. So, 
And, and, and regardless, if you look at credit cards, credit cards have been going down too since 2020 here, here in blue. Um, auto loans have been going down as well. Auto loan delinquencies. And, you know, pretty much everything else. So sure, student loans may have dropped off a cliff, but it's not the only thing uh, that matters. So, you know, keep, let's, when everyone's thinking the same thing in terms of a recession, in terms of a hard landing, um, the market doesn't price in the obvious. If everyone thinks something is obvious, then the market, it's already priced in. You know, there's nothing, there's no, there's nowhere for the market to go. The, the mar you're always going to see the unexpected in the market for the most part. Um, that's just the way it goes. You know, that's why being a contrarian is the way to do it. But that's all I got here for you today, guys. If you enjoyed this video, give it a, a like, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you in the next video. See ya.